On behalf of the Diplomatic Academy, I'd like to welcome all of you to the inaugural lecture of this year's DA Fulbright Professor. This evening's lecture has a threefold character. In the first instance, this is an IDS, or an interdisciplinary seminar, for our second year master's degree students. What this means in practice is that they get the first crack at asking the questions today when the discussion time arrives. So welcome to the students. Secondly, this is a club DA event for our alumni, for our former students. So I welcome all of you back to your alma mater for this lecture. And finally, of course, this is a public lecture for the friends and stakeholders from Vienna and beyond. So welcome to uh, all of you. Now, at the beginning, I should say that three institutions have co-sponsored this event. They are Fulbright Austria, the Austrian Fulbright alumni, and the Embassy of the United States of America in Austria. So I'd like to thank all three of these institutions and to welcome their representatives uh, this evening. Now, let me say a few words about the DA Fulbright Professorship because it's an important part of our academic program. We have a very small uh, resident faculty. We have a large faculty, but we have a small resident faculty. And what this Fulbright professorship means is we have an additional professor in residence during the second and third terms. So this is a great help to all of us. Uh, it's a big plus for our program that we have an additional resident uh, professor. Now I've been looking this up, and I realize that the Fulbright professorship is about, next academic year is about to enter into its 20th year. So next year we will celebrate the 20th anniversary uh, of this chair. It was begun back in 2000, 2001, when Ernst Sukaripa was director of the Diplomatic Academy, and Lonnie Johnson was at the helm of Fulbright of Austria. Now looking at the list of people, I think 19 people have now uh, held this chair. They have come from all regions of the United States north, south, east, west, and quite a few from that big thing in the middle, <laughs> the, the, the Middle West. They have come from big universities and small institutions. And even though they are all political scientists, uh, they, political science is a big tent. And so their interests and specializations have been unbelievably uh, varied. The only other thing I can say is that there have only been three women who have held this chair in the past uh, 20 years. With some of these professors, we've maintained a long-term relationship. Uh, uh, with Richard Harknett, who was the first holder of the chair, uh, he's continued to teach here, and he will be back in the third term. I think he teaches a course for us on cyber security. And another one is teaching with us now, and this is Stuart Kaufman, who was in the audience with us today. There's Stuart. Stuart, I can't believe it. You were the tenth. Uh, so the time passes very, very, very uh, quickly. Now, in thinking about this chair and talking to students, I realized that the name Fulbright is now almost only associated with the cultural exchange programs that Senator J. William Fulbright helped to establish back in the 1940s. What this means is when you say the word Fulbright, it's this cultural exchange program that people think of. And I find it a shame that so much of the, the many of the historical aspects of Senator Fulbright's life and works are unfamiliar to a younger generation of Americans and Europeans. So by way of an introduction to our speaker, I want to talk a little bit about at least one aspect of William Fulbright's uh, life. He was senator from Arkansas, and I think he's one of the pivotal figures in American domestic politics and American foreign policy in the middle of the 20th century. Now, in the middle of the 1960s, Fulbright was the powerful chairman of the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And although he had been a supporter of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and this is the resolution which authorized or enabled the escalation of the Vietnam War, he soon became, became disillusioned as the disaster began to unfold. And thus, and this is interesting to compare the Senate then and the Senate now, as a sitting Democratic senator, he challenged the sitting Democratic president over the war of Vietnam and held Johnson to the fire, the administration to the fire, with a series of very famous hearings in the Foreign Relations Committee. And then in 19, 1966, he published a book which had great importance for my generation. That book is called The Arrogance of Power. And I suggest everybody go look at it because it still has, in my opinion, a considerable contemporary uh, relevance. In The Arrogance of Power, Fulbright attacked the justification for the war. 
He noted the failure of the Congress to set limits on that war, and he questioned the impulses in America which had given rise to the war in Vietnam. So I think we need to remember, in addition to this wonderful program of cultural exchanges, we need to remember the historical figure of J. William Fulbright. And one can only wonder, for example, what on earth, if he were here today, what he would have made of the war in Afghanistan. Because next year, the war in Afghanistan will also celebrate its 20th anniversary as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Fulbright chair here. What on earth would William Fulbright have made of the recent publication of the Afghanistan papers by the Washington Post, which detailed the deception and colossal mismanagement of this war in Afghanistan? Well, we're lucky today to have with us someone who can help us understand this, someone who can help us make sense of the American way of going uh, to war. And that is John uh, Garofano, uh, the, the, the new incumbent of the Fulbright Chair uh, here at the Diplomatic Academy. He has a BA from Bates College, an MA from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and a PhD from Cornell University. He is presently Professor of Strategy and Policy at the US Naval War College. Through, in his career, he has had a whole series of distinguished appointments at the University of Southern California, University of Pittsburgh, the US Army War College, and the JF Kennedy School of Government. He's author and co-editor co of books on the Indian Ocean, Problems and Prospects for US Foreign Policy, a very interesting one on the intervention debate, debate, doctrine, criteria, and judgment, and also on Clinton's foreign policy, a documentary record. His current project, his current research project, is one that we very much look forward to because it's called Getting It Wrong, U.S. Military Intervention Since World War II. I would like to add to this that in 2011, he had experience in Afghanistan, in Hillman province, uh, working with the Marines there. And finally, I will add, having mentioned the Afghanistan papers, that John is one of the people mentioned, cited by the Washington Post in reporting those Afghanistan papers. So John, welcome, thank you very much, and we look very forward to hearing an explanation on the American approach to war. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, guests, it's an honor to be here this evening in this great institution and to be a representative of the Fulbright uh, program, which has done so much to share ideas and build bonds. Uh, and to some extent, I think that's what I'm going to get to at the end of this talk, which is uh, what kinds of ideas might improve decision making on the use of force. I, I do want to talk about this, what I think is the most important decision that a state can make, and that is. Uh, when you decide to uh, uh, embark on an, uh, on an uh, adventure which expends lives and treasure and reputation. I've always had an interest in organizations, uh, probably being the son of an engineer, uh, and I've always had an interest in failure, probably from being at so many academic institutions and uh, working with the federal government in very, very different capacities. Uh, but to me, this is fascinating when suboptimal outcomes occur uh, <coughs> despite the best intentions of highly intelligent people trying to effect them. Uh, so uh, tonight, I want to make four main arguments. And uh, just to note on the photos here, I'm going to talk about deliberate and less deliberate decisions. On the top, you have two pictures of what's seen, what, what were deliberate decisions. On the left, it is the uh, declaration of war for World War I in the Congress, uh, something that doesn't always happen. And on the right, uh, of course, uh, one of the few photos uh, of the invasion of Normandy, again, the result of a war and planning, which was a quite deliberate process. Uh, on the bottom left there, you have uh, the remnants of the Marine barracks bombing in Beirut, 1983. Uh, and on the right, that is uh, the area around the Busan perimeter, uh, where US forces were uh, pushed and just remained a, retained a toehold in June of 1950. And I'll talk a little bit about those two. Those are the results of uh, less uh, deliberate decisions. So I'm going to make four arguments. 
First, there are some constants and commonalities among many US decisions on using force, both large and small. Uh, in short, the president is in charge, uh, in charge, extended deliberation is not the norm, and decisions can often be characterized as impulsive and based as much on emotion as, an, as on cognition. Now, there are millions of pages written about the deeper causes of many of the decisions I'll refer to, and also large structural <laughs> explanations offered by both historians and political scientists. And of course, these deep causes and big ideas have impact. Uh, but when it comes down to it, decisions that surprise many people, uh, and it may be pulling troops out of Syria, uh, or striking high-ranking officials in Iraq, are not atypical. Uh, this is the way that many use of force decisions are made, if not most, in American history. Uh, I want to point out, and I may refer to some of these, it is not a distinctly American characteristic either. So we can point to uh, decisions all over the globe by other nations, other regime types, which make the same kind of decisions on this vital uh, uh, issue. So I'm going to go through a few cases uh, briefly, and I'd be happy to uh, discuss them more if you'd like. I've spent a lot of time uh, in dusty archives uh, and, uh, and love to talk about these. Mm -hmm. The second argument is that this reality is unlikely to change. Uh, and it's unlikely to change for reasons that are institutional, essentially. One set of reasons having to do with the Constitution of the United States and how it's been interpreted and presidential powers have been interpreted. Uh, and the other, I would argue, is the nature of the selection process by which presidents become president, become leaders of their party, go through elections, and become president. And there are two areas there that I'll, I'll mention, uh, which suggest that this uh, kind of decision making is going to be here for the foreseeable future. A third argument is that in any case, accurate pre-war assessment is very difficult. It is multivariate, and these variables have complex interactions. In fact, the use of force and military intervention, big military intervention in particular, is almost assuredly going to result by any state in any even minor, messy uh, situation in at least partial failure. And uh, I call this in the project I'm working on assured partial failure. That's the way it's going to be. But I want to spend a little time after we go through the cases talking about what are the requirements for a good pre-war assessment. Because a lot of the explanations that we hear about don't go through the entire panoply of things that a nation would have to get right. And I think what, I'll, what I hope to show is that that is nearly impossible uh, to get right. Uh, so political science and historical and other explanations often zero in on one cause or another uh, of particular failure. And I'm going to say we have to look at the whole picture. Otherwise, we're learning one simple lesson, which is not going to get us through the next, uh, the next war. Uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about what can be done. And I'll lay out a couple of modest proposals. And I think hopefully that's where many of you come in as you go through your careers. All right, if we think of. Uh, the decision process on the use of force as a continuum between, on the left, emotional, impulsive, reactive. What uh, Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, it's somewhat analogous to this, uh, called System One Thinking. Intuitive, heuristic-based, and essentially pattern recognition. And on the other end of the continuum, uh, a deliberate, considered, slow, cognitive, process in which all as much information, given the time available, is processed. Most US decisions have fallen on that left side. <laughs> I picked out a mix of larger and smaller cases, different parts of the world. Uh, but this list is much longer than what you see here. But for example, when Harry Truman was informed of the North Korean invasion on June 25, 1950, it came in the wake of two years of considered deliberate discussions, debates, and policy decisions stating that we will get out of Korea if it's ever attacked, that we're pulling our troops out, we, and, and clearly stating we know that South Korea may not be able to defend itself. Two years of this. When the request came, he was shaving. It was 5, five or 5.15 in the morning. 
uh, and he said, for request for ground troops, tell him he'll have them. Very little discussion, one short meeting the night before, and that, that happened to be based on a wildly inaccurate request in which the commander in the field, General MacArthur, said, and he believed it at the time, you would need one regimental combat team, possibly two, and we may have to build up to 30,000 troops. So 40 hour, 48 hours later, uh, the request was for 60,000, and three days after that, it was for 120,000 troops, which is not available. All right, so a quick decision reversing previous one. In this case, I'd say both impulsive uh, and emotional, but the reason, there are very good reasons for this, and I was asked before the uh, talk started, or am I going to talk about the deeper reasons, and we can get into that. But basically, things look very different when the front page hit and it looked like a massive uh, North Korean attack. All right. Lebanon, 1958, as another example. There was a coup in Baghdad on July 14, 1958. Major psychological blow. The decision to send Marines ashore in, Le to, in Lebanon was based on Eisenhower's shock, as he described it. I was shocked. He said, I went into this meeting, and this is one meeting where I just, my mind was made up before we started the discussion. And then the discussion went on about what to do, and he decided to send, <laughs> send Marines ashore. A somber tone of events. He was shocked by the mob participation, the dragging of the Crown Prince's body through the streets. Right. Now, he thought he could control events, and in a sense, he did, because this intervention could have been very different. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, Nathan Twining, Air Force, uh, we have no alternative to go in, but also the U.S. has to be prepared to go into the whole area, which is the Middle East. We're going to have to get a division of labor. The British have to go into Iraq and Kuwait. Israel has to move into West Jordan. Turkey has to move into Syria. And there was other support for things like this. So the president made an impulsive decision. It's his decision based on his interpretation, not deep knowledge of the region, but what he's seeing in the, pay in the newspapers. Right. And he thinks he can control it. And that is something that we, I'm not going to talk a lot about, but we see it in, in all of these cases. Uh, now, the Tonkin Gulf, which was referred to, and we might want to uh, talk a little bit more about Fulbright in the Q&A, but the Tonkin Gulf is a fascinating case, in part because it is so misunderstood. President Johnson had long prepared and had a standing internal policy that he was going to go to Congress and get a declaration of war if there was a major escalation in ground troops. The Tonkin Gulf happened a year before that escalation. But that was the policy, and that's what he fully intended to do. But then what seemed like two attacks on US ships changed all of that. In a very short period of time, a day or two, the president decided he is going to go to Congress and get an open-ended resolution, completely throwing his, his approach to the war out the window. It had to do with, well, it was an impulsive decision, but it had to do with, he, he wanted an answer very quickly on whether, both, whether there were two attacks uh, because he wanted to go uh, to the American public and make a nationalized speech in order to first force the Congress, essentially force their hand, give him this resolution. They had to do that uh, within the news cycle in those days uh, when he, he had to go on primetime television to do this. And so he kept forcing his Secretary of Defense to find out was there a second attack or not because he wanted to know if this is really a concerted North Vietnamese attack. Now, the transcripts are fascinating to, look to, to read because then you can, they're actually the tapes are available of a lot of them. Uh, and it's, it's clear now that actually McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, and the President truly believed that two attacks had happened on US ships. And so he felt he was in the right. That lasted for, I don't know, a couple of weeks, uh, maybe a couple of months. And after that, he figured out that he was wrong. And he would forever tell his military brass, you guys were shooting at flying fish out there. You know, every time they bring in the recommendation, he wasn't crazy about it. Um, so that's, that's, uh, th I think that's a good example of how this incredibly calculating individual, all right, a master of the Senate, and someone who a year later would engineer keeping the Southern Democrats on board for his civil rights legislation 
by going to war in a particular way where he gathered their support for that as well. I mean, he really was a master politician and a deliberative person, and in this instance, in a very, with, with tremendous repercussions for the rest of the war, uh, and repercussions in foreign policy that we, we see today, and repercussions that would lead to the War Powers Resolution, uh, took this step in a very impulsive uh, way. Uh, look briefly at the first President Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. Now, he was a seasoned diplomat and one of the few presidents to come into office really focused on foreign policy, uh, because most American presidents are domestic. But his decision to reverse course after Iraq invaded Kuwait highlights the role of quick decisions, if not impulsivity, in these decisions. His initial approach was in line with his policy and our messages to Saddam, namely that Kuwait was an internal matter. It was a visit from Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher that, as she put it, stiffened his backbone, and which changed him and led him to Desert Shield using the argument, I think correct, that correctly, that a small Middle Eastern state should not be allowed to be extinguished and that this would have tremendous impact. But that was not how the President and Secretary of State saw it before that. So again, a quick, impulsive turn with great implications. And we should remember that his termination of combat, too, was based on his impressions of seeing the highway of death, <laughs> the road from Basra. Right, a very emotional response to that killing, and therefore making a decision which probably led to a peace settlement that we were not fully prepared for. All right. Um, Rwanda is a uh, questionable case. We'll talk about that. There was simply not a lot of deliberation on it. It was a there was a, a general sense among. Uh, Clinton and his advisors, and especially Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that there was nothing that could be done. Uh, there was no real analysis to that effect. Uh, but we, we can come back to that. But I think the Kosovo bombing, on the other hand, is part of this because that was a reaction to having done nothing uh, in the Rwandan case. Right. Unfortunately, this also seems to have been a pretty emotional decision taken without a lot of thought about the strategy that they would, that the Clinton administration would pursue over Kosovo. After a week of bombing, the National Security Advisor, for example, was asked, what's your strategy? Because Milosevic hasn't given in yet. And his answer was, more bombing. <laughs> now in this case, Clinton hoped for the best, and in the end, uh, he got it. But the, the, the way of getting there, uh, was not pretty. Also, there was no anticipation of, for example, the violence that would result following that and which led to 750,000 refugees. There was simply no thought to this because the initial decision to take action was on the impulsive side. All right, now not all decisions of this kind, not all decisions on the use of force result in the use of force. Uh, if you look, for example, at President Kennedy in 1961, he was facing a number of crises, but one of them was whether to go into the start of war uh, in Laos. And he had proposal for sending up to 30, 35,000 American troops with a large number of allied troops into this landlocked country. The discussions surrounding this decision were, if you look at the transcripts, incredibly weak and very little agreement on anything from the goals to the nature of the government that they were trying to get to the strength of the opponents, to the strength of uh, the Lotions themselves. And uh, he came into the final meeting, which was supposed to be a tiebreaker because his advisors were divided, and, and he walks in with the cables from the Bay of Pigs fiasco. And he says, if it wasn't for these, I would have believed you guys telling me that we can do this. All right? That's why we didn't intervene in Laos. It was no deliberate, deep analysis of the problem. All right. And there are other cases, I think this is a theme in every nation's foreign policy, but certainly in Americans, 
uh, that are not, there are interesting cases related to the, not related to the use of force, such as the pursuit of uh, the hydrogen bomb. You know, this was a decision which, uh, after Truman decided to take, to make this choice, uh, his advisors thought this was one of their greatest failures of all time because it had uh, massive implications for uh, U.S.-Soviet relations and for uh, Greek power relations and for nuclear proliferation, uh, and there was almost no debate and discussion on it. He literally asked uh, one advisor, can the Russians get it and when? And based on that, he said, go for it. Uh, so McGeorge Bundy, other na later national security advisors, written a very good book uh, looking at this. But there were many more decisions other than uh, on, on the use of force which uh, showed this. And another one, which is not exactly an intervention, but the first President Bush's call for the Iraqi people to rise up, you know, which resulted in terrible tra tragedy. This was, uh, this was a very impulsive mood, uh, move. Right? Not a lot of discussion on it, uh, and really a uh, major, uh, major mistake. Okay. Uh, the ones on the right are mixed cases. There was a lot of deliberation actually going into Iraq War of 2003. I'd say the impulsive uh, part of that decision was the fact that President George W. Bush probably, as, as far as we can tell, made the decision to invade within 70 or 72 days of 9-11. Uh, uh, not, I wouldn't say if that's impulsive, but it was a very president-centric uh, decision, and he slowly told the people around him that this was going to happen, and it was going to happen. Uh, the decision was made very early on. The Vietnam case is fascinating, and I can talk about that uh, all evening. But uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson pursued what was probably the most deliberate decision uh, of an American president going to war that we can find, in that he had. He pursued every uh, angle, every opponent. The groupthink does not explain that decision. Every opponent of the decision. He had highly respected Democrats and Republicans who he sought out uh, and forced them to make their best cases against it. Uh, and he's talked to members of Congress, including Fulbright, uh, and the extent that we can listen to these, you can all listen to these tapes now. Uh, and some of them he's acting, and some of them he's not. Um, but he had people like he could, the people that he considered his true heroes, who were the uh, great legislative leaders, and he sought them out and had um, some long knockdown, drag out conversations. It's still, and, and it resulted for other reasons, uh, based on his calculation of politics at home in Vietnam and, and going to, to war quietly. So you can have highly deliberative decisions uh, as well, which don't, don't, uh, don't end well. Uh, we can talk about, about that more, if you like. So I'll just close with one interesting episode, uh, which is, again, on the left side, and that's Operation Desert Fox from December of 1998. Uh, this was a four-day air attack, mostly on WMD, or at least they were trying to hit WMD, what they thought were WMD. Uh, targets in uh, Iraq, uh, and it came during Clinton's impeachment trial for lying under oath uh, about an affair with an intern, Monica Lewinsky. Uh, the operation was of mixed results, but in any case, that week, the Russian Duma considered a motion stating, quote, the State Duma appeals to Ms. Lewinsky to undertake corresponding measures to restrain the emotions of Bill Clinton. <laughs> so I think that proves my point that everybody recognizes that these are impulsive, impulsive decisions. All right. Now, if this is the norm, that left side, uh, why is that? Well, the first reason is really uh, the interpretation of the Constitution. The presidency, the executive branch, has won the argument over uh, who has the power to deploy forces, and can the president do that independently of the Congress? Uh, that has been expanded, that power has been expanded since the First World War. It has, uh, it has, been, pro it has uh, up been upheld in court cases, uh, and uh, there is no turning back. Presidents work with uh, the War Powers Resolution and report 
um, to the Congress and always state, I'm doing this because I don't have to, but, it, but um, you know, I'm doing it uh, in, uh, there's a phrase which they use, in consonance with the War Powers Resolution. But there is no challenge coming uh, from the courts or from the Congress, all right? So the president has the right to uh, deploy force. Uh, the second is that the war, uh, as I've already, I guess I've already covered, but the War Powers Resolution passed in 1973 was intended to be a break on, on presidential power. Uh, and I don't believe anyone can point to a case where that has held up, all right? It has not uh, prevented the president from deploying force and has not uh, caused the president to change strategy or cease or pull, pull troops back home. Uh, the second reason is what I call presidential personality. And this has to do with selection of presidential candidates. Almost every president has passed through an incredibly brutal uh, political process of getting to where they are. Not only has it developed an extremely thick skin, uh, which has implications for how you receive information from the people around you, um, but it results in a strong belief in their abilities and a strong belief in their system one intuitive kind of thinking. Most of them were told at one time or another they would never make it through the primaries. Most of them have done all of the hiring and the firing and ended up with the team that got them to where they are. Reagan, Clinton, they were all told by advisors it's done, drop out. And they said no. So these are people of uh, a steely backbone, whatever else you may think of them. Right? And it leads, I think, to certain ways of processing information and a certain confidence in their abilities. And they're all, they all, clearly, to get to that point, have intelligence, incredible intelligence of various kinds. Uh, but it produces someone who I think is going to be on that left side of the spectrum. All right, so why is this a problem, if what I've said is true? Um, there are a number of things that states have to get right in pre-war assessment, and this is really the heart of the talk and the heart of, I think, what we need to think about in terms of can these, for any state, can these be improved. Uh, I've called these, I have three types. Type one, I would list it as <laughs> fundamental ideas about the nature of war, which a leader or leadership has to understand if they're going to go to war when they should and if they're gonna do it properly. They're fundamental and they can be fatal if gotten wrong. Uh, they're first order truths. So chief among them is the Clausewitzian understanding that war is a political phenomenon. I mean, is that obvious to you? I don't know. But it's not obvious to a lot of policymakers. Uh, part of this is the fact that part of this means that uh, as a political phenomenon, force may or may not achieve the kinds of outcomes that is desired. Clausewitz emphasized both political purpose and operational objective. And the difficulty of marrying these two uh, is very high, given their often countervailing imperatives. Right? But we can go through cases, most cases, by many states, and find that this is not clearly understood by leaders. A second requirement is the recognition, uh, again, explained well by Clausewitz, the chance and probability play a major role in any conflict. You know, I've spent a lot of time in the archives, and you don't find a lot of recognition of this. Right? But these can be potentially war-changing factors. A third of this fundamental uh, nature of war category is that, as we say when we teach at the War College, the enemy gets a vote, uh, that war is interactive. And this is something that you don't always, uh, is not always appreciated by decision makers. I think part of it may have to do with uh, the nature of advice that the military provides, which often is based on extensive simulation of games, which goes through 
maybe one or two uh, steps in a, in a war, but does not really, cannot, because it's so complicated, think very far out. Right? But in any case, uh, if you look at Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, I think especially on those second two bullets, you'll find some uh, real question as to whether they were understood. And we can talk about some international uh, examples, I think. Uh, Israel and Lebanon in 82. Uh, <coughs> Sadat in getting to Camp David, you know, these are kind of contrasting uh, understandings of this idea as war, as policy. All right. Take two, three war assessment. Again, uh, as Klaus would say, you also have to understand the nature of this war. As he put it, the first, uh, the most far-reaching, the supreme, the act of judgment is understanding what kind of war you're involved in and not trying to turn it into something else. Uh, this is something that we... Now, is this difficult? Yes, we, it's still difficult. We still argue about what kind of war we're in in Vietnam. And we, we in the United States, all right? So this is nothing that's easy. Um, I'd say one thing, I, I, my impression when I got to Afghanistan was there are many different wars going on here. So this is an incredibly difficult thing to get right. Uh, what's the nature of this enemy? All right, and then these other, other questions are things that we can go through that list of cases that I talked about and, if you, and see that in most cases, we did not get these answered correctly. And by the way, the answer to can we train an army, it seems to me it's almost always in the negative. I don't know why that is, uh, but how many years in Afghanistan? Uh, so, um, do sanctuaries matter? Yes, and there are always sanctuaries. Is it, does it figure heavily in planning and in the decision process? Recognition of that usually does not. And then finally, this question of how many lives will be lost one might think that this is discussed in decisions on the use of force. It does not appear to be. It really doesn't. Fascinating study from the Rand Corporation. They dug up in early 70s. They went and interviewed uh, survivors of the Vietnam decisions to find out what they thought, what, what, what were the uh, understandings about what the casualties would be. And dozens of people said, we just really didn't talk about that. You know, we didn't think about that. So uh, that's not asked either, and just please keep these in mind because it gets to uh, what I think might help. And then finally, at the lowest but still important level, what's the duration of this war? And that matters for all of the earlier questions. Is there going to be adaptation? Will third parties intervene? Will something like the United States giving the Stinger missile to uh, in Afghanistan? in the mid-1980s. You know, if you have a war of a decade long, a lot of bad things can happen. If you have it for two decades, even more, can, more bad things can happen. Are you equipped? Uh, will public opinion support? Is there congressional support? Uh, and then questions of the financial, financial feasibility and long-term costs. Again, as that, like that question about casualties, not asked for the most part, not asked, all right? What's the role of allies? Um, I've talked a lot about one of the few cases I can find where you get this kind of integration of civil policy and military uh, uh, operational knowledge. And that was the Vietnam War that didn't happen, it was the Indochina crisis in 1954. And again, US policy was we cannot lose any piece of Southeast Asia. And for months as they deliberated uh, uh, the French fighting with the Viet Minh in the north of Indochina, policy remained and was uh, reiterated, we cannot lose a single piece of Indochina. And yet, Eisenhower decided to let it go in the end and let the northern half of Indochina uh, fall to the Viet Minh. Why was that? I'll just raise one interesting uh, thing that happened was the chief of staff of the army put together a team 
of experts in all fields, as he said, included economists and others, and sent them to the country to get some, get some estimates and answer some of these questions from the previous three slides. And these are the kinds of conclusions that they came up with. And the bottom line after you tell the president is it's going to take five to seven years, uh, and you're going to have to change your entire <laughs> fiscal policy. And Eisenhower was focused on the U.S.-Soviet competition. He truly believed that a strategic nuclear war might happen, and that the, US, the country with the strongest economy and the strongest government was the country that would recover from that, said, having had these questions mm -hmm. answered, I'm not going to do that. Now, the reality is uh, Eisenhower himself was of two minds, and, and uh, a part of him did not want to intervene in any case. But I think this is an example of the kind of study that we might do. So I would say, uh, after looking at these kinds of decisions on U.S. foreign policy, uh, that perhaps th 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 that the, the uh, essential nature of those decisions is not going to change, as I said, for those institutional reasons. Right? The nature of the constitutional balance and the nature of the presidential personnel, that, that's not going to change. Uh, but perhaps you could have something that would ask hard, painful questions and at least force the president to listen to them. Because we all know that presidents end up in a closed group often as they're approaching uh, wartime decisions. So I have this notion, which I've written about, of a presidential advisory board on the use of force. Um, you know, we don't allow presidents to do whatever they want in the domestic economy, right? Among other things, there's a Federal Reserve Chair. And this notion of an independent Federal Reserve is something that actually has diffused and spread around the world. It's under challenge lately in many countries. Um, but it provides statutorily independent advice. Council of Economic Advisors is something that is more under the control of the president. So the notion is, could you have something set up by the Congress which second guesses use of force decisions. And then who would you have on it? And in the sense, I'd say, the kind of people that Ridgway sent to Indochina in 1954, but the kind of people that if you look at the wars we're involved in today, you would want to have deal with questions, right? Economists, country specials, retired military, these are just the essence of, of, of a war like this. Uh, the second is this notion of civil military uh, education, the integration of all of those, of the kinds of information that you need to answer the questions on those three slides that I presented, the integration of that knowledge requires a firm grounding in each world. And I don't believe that overall we have that, uh, at least in Washington. In the professional military education system in the states, we do uh, a fair amount of educating of civilians and of State Departments. And when they come out after a 10-month master's uh, program, uh, or a year and a half master's program, they feel like they have a very different view on things, those civilians, as do the military who have introduced the international relations diplomacy and other issues. Um, but that's a tiny number of the civilians who actually have an influence in policy. One thing might be, for example, congressional staffers, of which there are thousands, um, could use some education, and especially as experience with the military decreases over time, and, militaries, and the, uh, the size of militaries shrink more and more. Uh, and perhaps there is a US Institute of Peace, and perhaps something like a civil military institute, an institute dedicated to sharing this kind of knowledge. Uh, could be set up, uh, or perhaps institutions like this, uh, or programs, could further that uh, kind of sharing of knowledge. And then finally, something that will never happen, which is a congressional revision of the War Crimes Resolution. There, there will be no significant agreement in Congress for the foreseeable future. Uh, Ten of the most divisive years, according to several metrics, have been in the last 20, and currently, um, I cannot see that the Congress uh, 
revisiting that. But if they could, um, rather than having the president report every 60 or 90 days, uh, there could be the forcing of the president to address questions that have arisen once force is deployed. Right? So if a number of assumptions that uh, uh, were uh, if a number of assertions made by presidents when force was deployed, for example, to Iraq or to Afghanistan or to anywhere else, uh, have not borne fruit after a year, then perhaps there could be some kind of required reporting. We ch they try to do this through testimony and all that, but that's a different game. Uh, this would be more about actual information uh, that is uh, transferred, that is, that is shown to Congress or some independent body with, with appropriate clearances. All right, so those are three uh, modest proposals, but basically what I've tried to de uh, describe is a system that uh, is what it is. It is unlikely to change. It is not unique uh, in the world, um, uh, but it is uh, problematic and suboptimal. So I should leave on a happier note. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's ask, let's ask some questions. Uh, but, uh, uh, is there, uh, you know, this question of why, why is there no learning? It is kind of interesting. Um, I think one would be hard pressed to say there's learning over the last 40 years. Uh, we do tend to learn big lessons from the previous war. It said that militaries fight the last war, and I think policymakers tend to learn one big lesson from the previous war. So we learned no more land wars in Asia, you know, after the Korean War, um, and there will be lessons learned from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, <coughs> But uh, I think unless you go to those, those, the, that typology of what's required for a good pre-war assessment and figure out how we can learn those as a whole, then there's not going to be any uh, coherent. And um, one thing to consider is, is this, is this assessment going to get easier or more difficult with the increase uh, in non-state actors uh, and with uh, certain forms of WMD, such as biological weapons, and I would say the latter. Um, and we can talk about theory if you like. I love talking about our theory, but Tom warned me to stay out of that topic. So. <laughs> but with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Well, Lord Sean, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. You can only say that since we live in the age of the stable genius, we might add fasting and prayer to your modest proposal list. Uh, in any case, we have uh, questions that we'll begin with the students uh, from this uh, second. I would ask everyone who asked a question to identify themselves, please. And we start with the students. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for this very interesting lecture. Uh, my name is Victoria Spötle, and I'm a second year student here at the Academy. Um, you mentioned in your lecture that there are basically two types of decision-making decision processes. Um, um, on the one hand, impulsive emotional decisions, and on the other hand, uh, the deliberate and considered um, decisions. Would you argue that in the past, um, presidents have based their decision on going to war or not going to war on upcoming elections and on the fact that they wanted to be re-elected? And my second question would be, um, do you think the decision of going to war depends on if a president wants to get reelected or if the president is already serving his second term and so he simply doesn't have to care anymore about voters? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And I actually took domestic politics off of that slide with the two big reasons for why things won't change. Domestic politics, I think, can point in both directions. Uh, it can cause them to be more or less uh, adventuristic. There is not really good data, I believe, for the, what is it, the tail wagging the dog. That is domestic politics, pub public opinion, leading presidents uh, to do, uh, to, to go to war. So I don't think there's great evidence for that. Uh, and no president wants to lose a war. So I don't think domestic, but now there's the famous discussion in the Cuban Missile Crisis 1962 where the first uh, uh, time they're looking at the pictures of the Soviet missiles in Cuba, McNamara says, 
I think you have a you have a problem. And Kennedy says, Yeah, I know, I know, I do. He says, Yeah, it's a political problem. And Kennedy says, Yeah, I know. Um, and later, he says, if we hadn't done anything, I would have been impeached. So, you know, there are certain things, I suppose, where domestic politics uh, forces some kind of action. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think that explains why Kennedy tried to get the missiles out of Cuba. I think any president would have done that. Uh, does that answer your question? Sort of. Yeah. Uh, Professor Carozano, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Elvis, and I'm a student here at the Academy. Um, what, in your opinion, would be the incentives for US Congress not to reclaim at least some of the war powers? Um, and how could they, what would be the process to reclaim uh, those powers? Um, in, in, um, in relation to what my colleague just asked, is there at least a correlation uh, between uh, favor favorability ratings and uh, decisions going to war. Um, is there, I mean, there must be, you, you said that yes. the data is not perfect, but there must be some, some trend in, in the data. Um, uh, and a provocative question at the, at the, at the, at the end. Um, what processes would have to be changed in the American system to make decisions uh, to go to war more deliberate? And because you pointed out that one of the most deliberate decisions going to war, the Vietnam War, and resulted in the heaviest casualties. Is this even something that the Americans should um, aim for? Well, you know, we make decisions all the time in uh, the academy of whether to give someone tenure. And basically, uh, with whatever system has been used, we're right half the time. So I think even if you have a highly deliberate system, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a question as does good process lead to good outcomes? I think. Most people who study organizations, most of the business school literature um, would say yes. The, the issue in 65, and I think 65 led to a medium quality decision. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. Johnson moderated the right way. He gave a blank check to the ground commander. You can have whatever troops you want. Then he exerted tight control over air power because he didn't want China entering the war, basically. So he chose to try to fight a war limited in those ways. Uh, and I think, and I, and I, when I talked to people who worked very closely with him, uh, and he knew every, seemed to know every square inch of territory, and there was no question you could not ask him on the military side or the international diplomatic side that he could, did not have an answer to. Uh, he just thought we could win, and he was willing to take that risk. So I think that's an example where uh, another president wouldn't have taken that risk, but the fact that he had a good, strong, deliberate process is a good idea, and I, I think that that is exemplary in some ways. I don't know of any other president. I don't believe that um, any of the rec any of the last three presidents, or four, going back to Nixon, I don't think. I'm not sure about Carter. I don't know a lot about, about that. That they sought out the kind of information that was sought out before Vietnam. If they had, I think you know, some of those decisions could have been a little better. So it's an open question, uh, but I have to think, you know, as in your life, you want more information uh, and you don't want to do everything, make all your big decisions based on intuition, some of them. Uh, data supporting going to war, just very briefly, uh, there's a, there, a data supporting taking a strong, if you, if you take a strong stand in foreign policy, you get, a, you get a blip. The data shows that. It does not show that it continues. And Kennedy, after the Bay of the Pigs, got a very strong bump up because wow. he took full responsibility, and, but it continued. Um, and, uh, you know, every, every president's ratings go down during the war. <coughs> They're associated with that war. I think that would, if, if anything, induce caution. Um, and then your first question, I wasn't sure I understood it, but is 
does Congress have an incentive to reclaim it? I think actually they have other priorities right now, and they don't. Um, they don't. Uh, what's their incentive on foreign policy? It's not to take any stands that are not going to get them reelected or that are too controversial. Um, <clears throat> I think many in Congress just believe that it is Article Two, sec uh, uh, Section Article One, Section Eight gives them the right to declare war, and that this means they should have a lot more to say about uh, uh, going to war, and that's uh, probably probably accurate. So I think the incentive is simply. You know their interpretation of the Constitution, their responsibilities. Those who take take pressure. That's the incentive to uh, to have a stronger. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Professor, for your interesting insights. Um, my name is Max Santner. I am a secondary student from the DA, and I would like to know your view, since you are pro probably one of the people who knows most about uh, presidential decision decision making when it comes to going to war. What concrete piece of advice would you give to an American president when it comes to making this very, very important decision? The concrete piece of advice, you know, the concrete piece of advice would be to um, listen to people you don't want to listen to, and listen to experts. And if I had to really narrow it down, I would say listen to country experts. Uh, and if it's going to be a long war, I would say listen to economists, people who actually know. As, as for example, in Afghanistan, can we create an economy which can sustain itself? And can we change the nature of that economy? That's a huge question. We spent a lot of lives uh, trying to do that. Uh, and in the province I was with, it was in uh, building a highway which was uh, supposed to have certain economic benefits connected to other, other, other things around it. And you know, there wasn't, uh, that probably wasn't that, that realistic. Um, so those would be the kinds of pieces of, of advice to keep it short. There's a lot more. I'm full of advice. I'm an academic. Um, hello, my name is um, Olga. I'm also a student at the Diplomatic Academy. And um, since Michael you're from, so I'll speak. Well. Is it better now? Yeah. Um, okay. So my name is Olga. I'm a student at the academy. And uh, since you were referring to thinking fast and slow and the system one and two, I wonder if there's um, literature or if there's like at least a debate now on how to activate the system too in, in such decision making processes well I agree that um, the decision to go to war has to be a quick one in most of the cases right but still um, in the lives of, of, uh, of other people and in the lives of the, the your own citizens are involved shouldn't be there are more um, strategies developed to kind of um, at least try to, to move towards the, the other direction? You know, on the scientific question, are there ways to trigger it? I don't know. It's a great question, and I'll have to look at that. The, the bigger problem is that System 1 and 2 really ap uh, applies to individuals, and so I'm already stretching that to say that it applies to an organization. But you could ask, how do, you, how do organizations learn? I mean, how do organizations learn and function well? And there is plenty of literature there, uh, and it has to do with the structure of information, the flow of information. Learning organizations is one recent phrase and catchword, and there's some, even a book or two that have applied that to um, uh, foreign policy making. So, yeah, we can talk more about that. But um, I, don't, I don't know, in terms of the social, the social psych stuff that the Kahneman is doing, I don't know if there's something about triggering it. It's an inter inter interesting question. Yeah. But, you know, in the every administration comes in and tries to have a National Security Council which, which works and which flows as, and, and gets the right information to the president when it's needed. Um, and uh, there have been as many different forms of that as there have been presidents and administrations, and they change within administrations too. So, um, and there's there's some, and there's there's a fair amount of literature on that in the foreign policy making. Yeah, thank you very much from my side as well. My name is Rafaela. I'm also a second year my student. Um, you just mentioned that it might be beneficial to uh, lend an ear to economists when making the decision of going to war. My question regarding that would be, uh, what if um, economists advise it due to uh, domestic positive effects like increased production, like uh, lower levels of unemployment that are very important, of course, for uh, in, in times of elections and uh, for popularity. 
Uh, and then my second question um, would be, we talked a lot about the um, right end of your spectrum, so to say, so uh, which um, specialists to consult. But what about, uh, and this might sound a little bit naive, I am aware, but uh, what about furthering the left side of the spectrum, uh, the emotional intelligence that um, goes into this decision making? And um, yeah, how do you think this process that creates a steely back, as you said, it uh, might be changed into something, or the culture surrounding it might be changed into something where uh, the lives of people affected by war become an actual category. Mm -hmm. um, economists might recommend that. I, I don't find it likely that many recommend going to war for domestic <coughs> production. I know war has a effects on domestic production and it can have a beneficial effect on it um, and, and wars can have beneficial effects on um, other countries too. I mean Japan grew tremendously during the Korean War because of, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but you know I think you have to just uh, ask, ask the questions that you need to ask and I'm more focused on the country number one. So how important is the economy there to building a sustainable government uh, and civil society. Um, and secondly, the long-term costs to the United States, in this case, or the intervening state. And that's something that does not necessarily get asked, although I'm not sure anybody could have predicted what the long-term costs to the, Af the Iraq and Afghanistan were, because to do that, you have to understand that you're going to be there for 10 or 20 years, and that was not really on, 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 the, you know, on the table at the time. And as far as furthering the intuition and having a um, more receptive individual, I think that's another great question, along with the one about how do you trigger the, the, the other side. Um, and uh, I don't know the answer to that. If you ask presidents, they might say, be nicer, you know, because I'm getting a lot of flack. But uh, I, I don't know. That's a great question. Okay, we can now open the discussion to everybody. Gaetan, I think there's a question behind the students there. Yeah, thank you. Olivier Shilovsky, I have a private sector background. In your model, how do you see the difference uh, in this type of wars that you have shown compared to unconventional warfare, special operations, Cold War, and now like Global War and Terror? How much is there a difference in the use of force? Well, I think the first and second category of questions probably remain the same, or at least some of that second category. And I think the third would be very different. In fact, the reason that we fight some of these wars in this way is so that we don't have to get to that third category and ask a, a lot of, and have a lot of other difficulties. Um, I think, you know, come to think of it, I'm not sure there's, uh, well, there's a, there's a lot of critiques of the war on terror and special operations, but the nature of those wars means that we don't have the same kind of information so that we really have an ability to process trace like we do with some of these bigger cases. But Latin America Cold War, there's already a lot known. Yes. Um, you talk about covert interventions exactly. and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, um, I think you could apply most of these questions of, war, of what's the nature of war and what questions do you need to understand. Um, and I think a lot of you, you would have to ask, uh, what's the long-term result of what I'm doing? And what's you know part of that is reputational, and part of that is how do you affect uh, other regimes in the region. So um, yeah, all I can say is there, there it's it's an area that I haven't looked at extensively, but I think similar questions similar questions apply. Yeah. I mean, do you have a do you have a thought on left side versus right side? Um, no, I'm just uh, yeah. For myself, I mean, your model is uh, very interesting and new to me, so I'm just trying to process the difference in those type of operations. Yeah, I mean, for what we know in the public literature on 
some of the interventions in the 50s, like uh, Iraq, uh, Iran rather, and uh, Guatemala and the Philippines. Um, you know, these are the uh, stories that we succeeded, the United States succeeded in doing what they wished. Um, and interestingly, they had a strong impact on the way we looked at uh, Vietnam because Kennedy and then Johnson kept saying, we need a mixed You know, we need to find one of these. They have to be out there. You know, there has to be someone who can pull this small, small country and small government in Saigon together. Um, yeah, so, so I think, yeah, it's a good question. It's not something I've worked on. Okay, Professor Kaufman, we'll have one Fulbright interrogate another. Thank you. Um, I, that was a great talk, John. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, with your permission, I'll, I'll start by um, suggesting a couple of quick answers to one of the one of the uh, student questioners um, on the economic effects of war. Uh, the uh, the uh, the prize-winning economist uh, Paul Krugman described war economically as a process where you build ships and then you sink them, and you build airplanes and you crash them. Um, so I, I think it's always the case that there are better economic, better alternatives to improve the economy than going to war. Um, and um, on, on the question of, you know, can you, can you improve the emotional intelligence of the president, um, I just want to point out that I think Professor Garfano actually answered that by pointing out that the, the experiences that the president goes through in becoming president, um, you know, molds his, in, uh, his uh, emotional intelligence in a very specific way. And there's really not very much you could do about that. I think, you know, John, you, you answered it before it was even asked. Um, uh, the, I, the questions I have for you are, um, first of all, um, on, the, um, uh, on this idea of a sort of presidential advisory board um, on going to war. Um, what would you think of the idea of, ha of having it be um, under Congress the way the Office of Technology Assessment used to be? Because Congress, because you know, anything reporting to the president is, is going to be used by the president for his purposes. So if it reports to Congress, you can give them all this information that they need to punch, to, to, to punch back instead of being in a situation where they're just, um, where, you know, as with Bush, you know, just stonewall uh, Congress refused to give them any information. Um, so I wonder what you uh, what you think about that idea. Yeah, so I think it's a great idea, and that would give Congress more of an incentive to pursue something, which, which so that might work. But but, but 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 I will say, will that if 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 what matters is the deliberative or non-deliberative process. So if what matters is what the president uh, is thinking and what his uh, national security council or advisors, if it's an informal group. If that's the goal, and if you need to get them to think about things, would it would having it under the Congress, um, and you know another report going up or another re uh, press conference, would that get them to think any differently? So what I think of is so the, for those in 2002 and three who had uh, optimistic views of the Iraq War, how do you get them to think differently? Right? How do you get them to ask? hard questions. Uh, so my concept was you need people who they have to either respect or pay attention to for some reason, ideally both. So I don't know which better. I, I hadn't really thought of that, and I haven't heard that. So that's a very good uh, you know, and interesting suggestion. Well, we've had a lot of questions from my impulsive left. We need some deliberative questions <laughs> from, my, from my deliberative right. Ambassador Briggs. Oh. Professor Garofano, I enjoyed your talk. But uh, you talked only about America going to war. This is half of the equation. Is there a difference in what, in what you're doing uh, with getting out of war? Are these decisions uh, similarly conceptually to be, to be studied? Or is there a difference? The recent examples, Syria, the ongoing example uh, of Iraq. Do you have anything to say on, on this sort of getting out of war? Well, I, I actually picked this topic in part because of um, thinking of the decision to get out of Iraq, uh, out of Syria as well. 
uh, which you know to me came as a surprise, and to others like General Mattis, I we was he still in it? Uh, but um, so I think they apply to the decision uh, to. Uh, they could apply to the decision to get out. But I think that decision is much more political. So if you think of France uh, leaving Algeria and the United States leaving Vietnam, uh, that is a, there are some similarities where, uh, well, it took the United States much longer, I guess. There has to be enough uh, pain politically and what you find, I think, in, in, in those cases, in the Soviets in Afghanistan, uh, possibly India and Sri Lanka, I think also in Israel, you, you have a change of regime. So you basically, there has to be a change of government and a change of administration. Uh, so, you know, if, if President, if, if there was a time, the, the last easy time to get out, or not easy, but the last time to get out would have been under President Obama. Um, and I think he didn't because, you know, he believed that um, we could still pull out a, a, an outcome which was, which was better than if we just pulled out and lost. So, but I think that's a much more political process. Good question. I mean, it's, it's a fair question. I know there's a new, uh, I haven't read it yet, there's a new article that just came out on the U U.S. getting out of uh, Lebanon in 83, which is in the Texas National Security Review. Um, which looks to be extremely well researched, but I haven't read it. So, but I think it's more political. Whereas going in is less political and doesn't involve the Congress, doesn't involve public opinion as much, is much briefer, and getting out is always going to be uh, much longer. Okay, we have a question here in the second yeah. row. Gus will bring you the microphone. Uh, uh, um, you may have a, uh, can you hear me? Yeah? You may have a budget dedicated to the armed forces, but have you one um, in assessment of uh, getting provoked into war for those forces? Yeah? And uh, have you considered, or are you considering? Uh, let's say, uh, possible stalemate, um, economic collapse, last not least, even defeat. Uh, am I considering, or do uh, you mean do policymakers in, consider? In general. Oh, yeah, good, right, right, right. Yeah. right. So behind, behind the impulsiveness, uh, there are a couple of uh, ideas you might call sticky ideas or assumptions behind American policymaking yeah. when it comes to the use of force. And losing is not one of those. So there is a tremendous belief in, uh, I think there's an assumption of staying power. There's an assumption of a military force, which is unequaled. Um, so no, defeat is not really discussed. And there's there's, uh, there's not a lot of discussion about that, that that I've seen in the documents. There is a little bit in Vietnam again in 1965 um, from some people that he trusted like Clark Clifford and George Ball and, and, and to some extent uh, Richard Russell. Um, and they, you know, Clifford said, I foresee a great tragedy for my country. And then he came in, and he was a very good Secretary of Defense, and he towed the line. So, no, there's not a lot of discussion of that. Yeah. And your first question, is there a budget for assessment? Yeah. Is it Who covers the cost? Of, of what? Of assessing? Yes, uh, and of uh, uh, realizing. Yeah. Well, the, we, we're still figuring out the costs of uh, both of these wars. And, um, you know... I, the American public pays a lot of it, uh, and I'm sure a lot of it gets passed on somehow in, in international interactions. <coughs> it's a positive aspect. Yeah? Right. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more question if somebody would like to ask. Here, here we have one here, Gus.
Thank you very much, Professor, for your interesting talk. I'm Michael. I'm also a second year student in the MICE, BA MICE program. Um, I'm dwelling a bit further on the emotional intelligence question, and I want to know the, sort of the personality of the president. I'm asking um, um, this because um, leading up in the, in the build up to, to the election in which Donald Trump won, even before he became the Republican nominee, I read articles that sort of portrayed him as Trump the dove and Hillary Clinton the hawk. So sort of this package, the which, you know, sort of ideology that people portray even before he went through the processes, you know. So what's the personality, you know, the bearing of the personality in sort of this decision making? And also in terms of um, intervention in wars, does the global perception of, you know, people being fed up as, you know, America being the global policeman and all, does it have an influence? So here I'm looking at the global perception in terms of decision making as when um, they're, they're making the world decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, there is not a lot of, I think, uh, concern about global, per, global perceptions when they're at the point of deciding that something is critical for U.S. national security. So if they think, if they have already gotten to the point where we have to decide whether or not to do this or whether or not to do this drone strike or whether or not, I, I don't think that they're worried too much about it. I think in general people are concerned about that. Most administrations are concerned about that. Um, but, but not really at that point. There's an interesting war game, that, a series of war games in, in the early 60s where uh, uh, there were very big simulations involving high-ranking high people around Washington. And they, sh they kept showing that global opinion turned against the United States if they started bombing North Vietnam. And so the response in the post-game discussions was, we have to do better at s selling this. You know, we have to explain <laughs> this better. So I think that like one of these other um, underlying assumptions is that if it's vital, we're either not highly concerned about it or we can <coughs> explain it explain it well. And it's a good question on hawks versus doves. Do people come in and basically that's their personality? Um, and I tend not to believe that. Uh, I think a lot of hawks have made dovish decisions. Uh, President Nixon, for example, being one, he made a lot of hawkish ones too, but he made uh, dovish decisions. And people who come in as doves like Jimmy Carter, uh, you know, the, 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 the lamb turns into a lion. So I think it's a little bit, it's a lot more contextual. Uh, well, John, welcome to Vienna. Welcome to the Diplomatic thank Academy. You. Thank, thank you for your lecture. Let me thank our co-sponsors again, Fulbright Austria, the Austrian Fulbright alumni, and the Embassy of the United States of America in Austria. Let me thank all of you for coming, and everyone is welcome to have a reception in the room next door where you can continue the discussion with our speaker. Thank you.